Cool. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm here to talk about Drupal 7 theming um, and theming front-end goodness. Uh, I'm going to talk about some changes in Drupal 7 and also look into the inheritance that occurs within the Drupal framework uh, for theming. Supposedly it's good to do a summary because everybody else is doing this, so I put this in at the last second. I guess the talk assumes some knowledge of Drupal themes, probably some HTML, CSS, um, doesn't really require any knowledge of PHP. My name's Amy Murray, that's where you can find me. I'm a Drupal Solution Architect, uh, working at Demons Media at the moment. Um, I uh, also do freelance open source solution design. I uh, believe in free speech and free libre open source software. And disclaimer, this was created using LibreOffice. Uh, I'm going to start with a real basic thing. Um, if, if, you wanna, if, if you find things that you might want to correct me on, or if you want to ask a question, uh, feel free to put up your hand, and we'll bring the microphone over because we need to record it. What is a theme? Um, well, on Drupal.org, it uh, describes it as, a theme is a collection of files that define the presentation layer. So in a CMS, a theme really is um, how that information is being presented to the front end. So we can think of it, in a sense, as our old index.html file with static content replaced by PHP variables. So uh, talking about Drupal 7 theme changes, I think is probably the best place to start. If you've been around since Drupal 4 dot prior to 4.7, <laughs> um, this is probably the biggest theme change we've seen in the community since Drupal 4.7, since we went from X template to PHP templating engine. So um, it's probably not as big as that, as in you're not having to do as many rewrites for it, but there is quite a lot of changes. Um, some people in the community have kind of said Drupal 4 and 5 theming was kind of like Drupal hell, Drupal 6 was halfway to heaven, and Drupal 7 is hopefully nearly there. So, it's just really all nice. Well, what the hell does that mean to all of us anyway? So, to start off with, um, you probably noticed in Drupal 7, uh, we've got a new, new way that we call content. So, we've got render and hide functions. So, hide enable allows us to actually hide um, information, and then render is enabling us to print it out. So here you've just got a really basic kind of example um, where you can see that we're hiding comments and links and then we're printing them afterwards. So that's kind of what the hide function and render does for us. But it is a new way of calling it as opposed to what we were doing in Drupal 6. Bye bye PHP template overrides. In Drupal 6 you could override. Um, so if I wanted to theme breadcrumb, I could actually call it through the um, theming engine. So I could call PHP template underscore breadcrumb. Uh, that has been depreciated completely in Drupal 7, so you need to actually go function theme name underscore breadcrumb. Drupal 6 did support theme name underscore breadcrumb, but it also had the old PHP template call as well, so that's no longer used. BoxTPL.php is now extinct. It, has anybody in this room ever used it? Yeah, that probably reflects the amount of people in the community that were using it as well. It was really, um, it was just something that was seen as not needed anymore. Uh, it's been depreciated and it will, as the dinosaurs, not be coming back unless somebody creates a Jurassic Park version of Drupal. Um, there has been a template delimiter change. So we only used to use um, one, whereas now we're using two dashes. So you can still use one to separate your names and that's been kept for logic. Um, but you need to go so it's no dash dash rather than no dash. So, um, we default regions in Drupal 7 have also changed. So we've got a new help region which is um, purely there to display the help information. There's a highlight region as well. If anyone's wondering what that does, that's actually replacing mission. Um, and content now must also be included in a theme, whereas it didn't have to before. There is also hidden regions in Drupal 7. Uh, has anybody played with hidden regions much? No, okay. Um, so why do we have hidden regions? The reason that we have hidden regions is because, let's just say on my site, on my right sidebar, I've got a wish list coming up, um, but that's actually being called from a module, and I want that on my store all the time. I really don't want people to be moving that block around. I can create a region called wish list, and then I can place it as a hidden region, so you can't see it in blocks, but the modules can actually still call an output to it. Um, so that's kind of really 
uh, what the purpose was behind doing that. Page top and page bottom are hidden regions by default in Drupal, Drupal 7, but you can also add your own. Hiding CSS elements, something that we all do in Drupal theming. <laughs> um, Element-hidden is a new class that we can call, and that will hide all elements from all users. So it completely removes that element, right? So that's class element-hidden, it's fantastic. Um, Element-invisible kind of works a similar way to display none in the sense that it hides the element visually, but if you're in a screen reader, you will actually still pick that up. So where it could be good for is if you want to actually provide some backing and grouping information for screen readers about the um, content that you've got um, on your site. More CSS changes. So uh, Drupal 7 decided to adhere to CSS naming conventions. For Drupal 6, we used to call it clear-block. You've probably seen that around. And if you come from CSS, you first look at it and go, clear block what? Am I clearing a block? Um, we've changed Drupal 7 to clear fix, and the reason it's changed to clear fix is because clear, clear fix is really sticking to the CSS naming conventions, and also clear block was confusing people in the design kind of end because it, thinking that it was clearing a block. Um, so that's kind of some of the reasoning behind that. So Drupal 7 gives us more power to be an individual and gives us a bit more power to kind of go a bit more individualistic with our themes. So we've pre-processed functions we've had for a while. Now we actually have process functions as well that occur in the theme level. Um, process functions will run after the pre-process function. So what this now enables is a two-step um, approach to theming. So let's just say in pre-process you want to add some classes to an array, but then you want to print it out in your template so you can use a process function to actually flatten that into a string and then pull that into your template and theme it as a string. Uh, Pre-process functions apply to both templates uh, that should be, and modules, sorry. <laughs> I'll correct that before I put it up. Uh, Pre-process functions are also called, as we said before, process functions, and it enables variables really to be placed. We look into that a little bit more later. Um, Hook alter, if you're a themer or you're working in the front end, you've probably heard back end and module developers talking about this hook alter thing and wearing all stickers and t-shirts with it on there. Um, it used to be a module thing, now it's a theme thing as well. So these are some ones that we have. So we've got um, hook page alter, um, which allows variables on the page to be altered or hidden. Hook form alter. So you know when there's a form and you just want to do a couple of simple little tweaks to it, um, but you now you don't really need to go back to a module developer to get them to create that form module or creating that form module yourself. You can actually use hook form alter to just do those minor little tweaks to it. Um, so it's a really good thing because it just saves that time of you know, always having to kind of recreate um, unique uh, form modules. Uh, hook JS alter and CSS alter does as it says. It um, alters that uh, JavaScript or the CSS presentation of the page. Node.tpl.php is no longer needed. And what I'm meaning by that is, it's not that it's out of core, it's in core, of course. But in Drupal 6, if you wanted to theme a content type, um, you would have to actually have node.tpl.php in your um, theme in order to do node-event. So if you just put node-event in without node, it wouldn't actually pick it up and work. In Drupal 7, you no longer need that. So you don't actually need to include node.tpl.php. So you can just use that from core and be simply um, theming your own. So for example, it's still going to call modules. So it's still going to kind of call, call node from modules, but then it's going to look at uh, your node event to actually theme it. So you don't need to be copying and moving that around. Somebody mentioned wildcards. <laughs> Um, wildcards are great things in the world of um, computing. They're absolutely fantastic. And it's been really annoying in Drupal theming, especially in 6, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have done it, where they've had to create multiple various different templates and, and stuff. And if you could only just use a wildcard, and now you can. Oops. I go backwards, sorry. <laughs> now you can. So basically, Drupal 7, we've now got wildcard suggestions in template names. So a uh, kind of example, um, this is the generic kind of example that uh, Drupal.org uses. 
So if you needed, um, in Drupal 6, you could theme user pages by going page-user. However, this would also theme login pages, and it would just apply overall everything. If you wanted to theme specific pages, you would actually have to use IDs in there to theme those specific pages, which could get really, really annoying. So in Drupal 7, you can now use uh, specify a wildcard. So in this example, you can now use page dash dash user dash percentage symbol, and that's actually going to be able to apply it to all user pages, but it's not going to apply it to the login. So that's kind of some uh, great things as well. That's a really kind of, I guess, in a sense, a high level overview of some of the changes, some of the more, I think, important, interesting ones. Um, I definitely think the CSS hidden and element visible and that are fantastic, great introduction. But there's a lot more. Um, there's probably been over about 50 or something changes done in the Drupal 7 theming. Um, so we've now got content appearing as a block in admin UI. Uh, blocks have more meaningful CSS classes, for example. So you've got block dash blog dash recent instead of block dash, you know, ID blah blah blah. Um, classes vary. Class classes variables can be added to your preprocess hooks. Um, there has been some additions and changes to Drupal add CSS. Classes and attributes are now standard and also predefined. Titles have all prefix and suffix. All titles have prefixes and suffixes added. Um, and various other ones of that, but I guess they're kind of some of the more, I think, um, interesting ones. And there has been some, I'm really into web accessibility, um, so I was quite happy and excited to see the changes that have come in Drupal 7 for accessibility. So RDFA uh, can now be included, but you need to make sure that you're actually um, including the griddle, so you're literally printing griddle underscore profile to get that in. Um, skip to navigation has been added to call. Um, I'd kind of probably like to see skipped content in there as well, but you can always add that in. Um, there's been a removal of a bunch of different duplicate and null tags, which really helps for accessibility. And if you are doing an accessible um, site, so if you're working for the government or you are somewhere that has to meet um, WCAG 2, if you have a look specifically for modules and themes that have the hashtag D7AX, that states that the maintainers of those modules and themes are working as hard as they can to make that output accessible and they're meeting um, the WCAG 2 guidelines. Um, also, now you can get modules and themes that have the way ARIA uh, roles included in them as well, um, which is another really fantastic um, change for accessibility. So I think with some of those things, it kind of puts Drupal at the forefront um, in what's going with accessibility. So many templates. Um, I'm not sure how am I going for time. Am I all right? Heaps. All right. So many templates. Um, I'm going to briefly kind of go over some of the new templates. Um, so we've got HTML.tpl.php uh, now. So the web page output is now constructed by HTML.tpl.php. It's no longer constructed by page. So page used to be the main caller in the page builder, um, but now that's become HTML. So page.tpl.php has been split apart. HTML.tpl.php now contains a content between the headers and, as I said, constructs that template. And it is crawling through to page. So what that enables us is it enables us for kind of a bit more granular control over it, over theming, and kind of also, I guess, follow some of the original um, designs of, of th uh, templating within PHP. So if we have a really quick look at that. Um, so you can see up there, I've, I'm printing out the Griddle profiles. Um, I'm also printing out the head, style, scripts. This, these, this is just the generic one, by the way, from um, my laser pointer's working. <coughs> no, it's not working today, all right. <laughs> um, so this is this generic ones from Core. So you can see, but what I'm doing there is I'm actually, no, it doesn't want to work. So I'm actually constructing the page in there, so it's page top, page, and then page bottom. There you go. So page top, page, and page bottom. So this here, print page, is actually calling page.tpl.php. So that's where it's sitting now. So page no longer contains the head information because that's in html.tpl.php, and it's also no longer constructing it because that's the html.tpl.php's job. And it really now only contains the contents between the wrapper divs. 
So if we have a look there, that's pretty much our page now and you can see that it's starting straight there um, within our wrapper. So we've taken out that top section and also the bottom section in page. Um, no tpo.php, probably not as many changes there. It's really doing as it did in Drupal 6. It's printing out main content. Um, of course, as we said before, you, don't have to no, long, you no longer have to put it in um, to your theme when you're creating custom content types. Um, naming conventions there, you've got no dash dash node ID for that specific, no dash dash type and no .tpl, so no major changes there, really. Um, and as we can see, it's pretty much looking similar to that. Um, and then we can see what we were showing before with our hide and then printing our render out. And there we can see the new way to print uh, our content, content fields out. Uh, new to uh, Drupal 7, I guess another way to add more granular control is region. So region.tpl.php um, allows for styling of the actual region area. Um, where's that come in handy? Well, you know, you, so you set up your site, you've got your right sidebar, your left sidebar. You might want your right sidebar to have a different background or to have um, a different CSS calls and that. Now you can actually do that straight from the uh, TPL. So it allows you to wrap a little bit more CSS and HTML around that. So it's more, as we were saying, more granular control of the Drupal output. So you can use region.tpl.php and that will actually um, style every single region on your site. So it will do everything from your menus to your sidebars to anything that is a region. However, if you want specific, there's a dash dash there. <laughs> if you want um, specific uh, sections themes, then you can go region dash dash uh, search or you can do region dash dash menu and that will just see in the menu, that will just see in the search region. So you can get kind of quite granular uh, within that for your theming. And if we have a look at it, we can see it's really just calling that. It's quite um, a very basic uh, TPL file. So there is quite a bit that you can do there with that. Another new uh, template to Drupal 7 is field. Uh, fields can be themed with field.tpl.php. You can theme individual fields or groups of fields or field types. Um, it will, if you are theming a, th a field type, it will theme all fields that are of that type, which means that if that type is appearing across three to four to five different content types, it's going to theme it the same across them all. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so if we, as we said, yeah, we create an image field and we use that across three content types, the field theme will apply to the field.tpl.php to all the three content types. So what we can do is we can get quite specific with that. So what we can say is I only want to fee field dash dash product image dash dash you know, products. And that will only fee uh, theme that field within that content type um, as opposed to going um, you know, field dash dash content type which will theme all the fields in that content type or field dash field name is getting more um, specific too. So you can see um, what we're doing is we're getting more, sp as what we did before, is we're getting more specific. If we have a really quick look, um, this is the default outprint of the field template. Um, so we've got a little bit of delta action going on there to render through the array. So there's quite a bit of changing, um, quite a bit of things that you can pull out of that and strip away from that as well and still have um, the functionality there. So not to you know, talk about this too much, because we kind of, I think, all pretty much know this, but as we can see, uh, HTML.tpl is really the frame around it. Page is now our kind of main section in there. Regions, we're theming those regions. And then we've got nodes, field within node, block, and the field within block, et cetera. So we can get quite granular now with how we really want to display those field types. So this kind of gets us to the interesting part. Um, Drupal likes to add its own HTML, which is a real annoyance um, for front-end developers and that, that kind of come from a non-Drupal background and also for designers as well um, <laughs> when you're trying to get them explaining things to them about inheritance. So what is the Drupal inheritance program, uh, process? Well, Drupal inheritance is basically a bunch of system overrides. It has a specific cascading order. 
So if we think about how cascading style sheets work and we think about how inheritance like that works and also inheritance within file permission systems, it's a similar kind of approach that the inheritance takes within Drupal. It's very powerful because it really does enable you to override the things you don't like. And that can be a frustration when people come to Drupal and they're like, there is all these CSS classes, there is all this shit here, all I want to do is get a basic simple style in it, I'm going to have to do display none to get rid of everything so I can get into what I want. Um, it can be frustrating, the inheritance process, if you don't understand it, because it, it's, you know, you really just don't want that extra crap there. When you start to get to understand it, it can become quite powerful because what it does is it enables you to leave the system defaults alone and actually um, take your changes and put it into your theme. So it means at any time, if something you think something's broken in your theme, or if you think something's going wrong, you can drop it straight into Garland and you haven't actually changed any of those defaults. So if it's something to do with your function or your thing that you've just created, dropping it into Garland is the way that you'll see. If it's appearing in Garland and it's not appearing in your theme, then it's probably something wrong with the way that you've done that in the theme. So the key thing to come out of this is we override and we don't hack. Um, oops, and what I mean by that is, is it, it, it's quite tempting sometimes within Drupal, I think when you're first coming to it, to just kind of go straight in there and start hacking things within themes and that um, we really don't want to be doing that. We really want to be overriding and following the, the way the framework wants us to do it. So if we have a really kind of quick, I guess, breakdown of that, you've got theme, um, which you can override. You've got your theme engine, which can be overridden. And you've got the modules, uh, the core modules, which is basically what we call the default. Uh, yep. Did you want to ask a question? No? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, now, I'm not going to really go into this because we really don't have the time and this would be a talk in itself, but the theme registry can actually also be manipulated um, as well. However, as a front-end developer, you do not need to go into the theme registry. Um, it's really just an additional extra thing if you want to. So, talking about like the process, let's look at how it's actually working within templates. So, Drupal Caller applies, in a sense, it, it's applying its own tpl.php files. So Drupal modules apply their own tpl.php files. And these that can get applied, in a sense you can think of it as it apply core first and then the, your t the module tpls will then get looked at. But your theme gets looked at last. So what this means is that your theme will always have the final say. So this is where the overwrite process comes into it. So we've got core tpl.php files here, which is what are the default files. We've got the module files here and we've got themes. So basically what's happening, if there's nothing in your theme, if it's looking for node and there is no node in your theme or in your modules, core will apply. But if you've got a node, for example, we're pulling node from core. In the module, we're um, creating our own node there, but then you've got one in your theme. Your theme is going to win. So you'll start to see a running, um, <laughs> start to see, uh, um, kind of all adheres to the same process. So core wins. Where does core win? Well, core wins, and this is kind of what we're talking about with the default process. So if we're doing html.tpl.php, because it's something that you don't really need to include in your template unless you really want to be doing some kind of major changes to that structure. Um, so we're normally going to be pulling that from core. Because we don't have one in our module, because we don't have one in our templates, core is going to win, and that's going to be applied from core. Um, inheritance within your own theme. Templates within your own theme can also be overwritten um, by other templates in your theme. So we've got the overriding process that happens from core to module to theme, but then we've also got overriding that happens within your theme. Uh, it really comes down to the most specific template to the least. So Drupal will always find the most specific. So that's where we're go really going into those naming conventions. So where we were looking before with region, for example, if, if we had region there, but then here we were going uh, region dash uh, sidebar, then that sidebar one's going to get accepted because it's specific. So we've got node here. This is within our own theme, by the way. It's not looking at core. So we've got node within our theme. We've also got node dash dash type, and we've got node dash dash ID, node ID. 
So here I've got a node event that happens to be node uh, 241. And I'm actually theming the event types, but for 241 it's a promotion, and I want to theme that specifically, different, maybe just for a couple of weeks or so. I can do that by going node dash dash node ID, and that is going to win out over the node dash dash uh, type. So it always goes from least to most specific. Do for module theming. Um, sorry. There's, uh, um, I think there's slightly more actually. I think because I did this count, I think I did it in around alpha days. So I think it's about 49 or I don't know, or something around a bit more. But there are 42 different TPL files in, in Drupal 7 core module, uh, modules folder. So each one of these can be copied and placed in your own theme to overwrite the output. So if a contributor module has a TPL file, this can be copied into your own theme folder and it will overwrite the TPL in the modules folder. So that's always the process we take and that's where we say don't hack core. It's literally, if core's got something in there that you want to use or if contrib has something you want to use, copy that and put it into your theme um, and then do whatever overriding you want in your theme. Never ever do it within that module itself, I guess is really um, the main just of that. So to theme a module, as we said, we take a copy of the TPL file we need. We move that to our own themes folder. Um, in Drupal 7, we can actually group it under the folder templates, which makes it a little bit cleaner. Uh, yes? So why are you trying to override it? Oh, hang on. I'll yep. Um, so when you try to override a template in a module, uh, you copy the files to your own theme, but you don't have to keep the same uh, folder structure. No, you like don't have to keep the no. same folder structure. Um, no. So what would happen if you have two modules using the same template name? Um, okay, if you have two modules using the same template name. All right. Um, you'd have to give me an example of where that might come up. Um, <laughs> yeah, it just, just pops out of my mind, I think. Yeah. Just uh, from a gut feeling, I think a triple probably just uh, take the, the first one that it recognizes. It depends on how those modules are being called and where they're being called, I guess. Um, but basically, I mean, generally something that you probably won't come across that much, especially in contributed modules and stuff like that. Um, but if there, if there is and you're having a, an issue with that, you literally take that, that file, the TPL, um, and put it in your own. Yeah, I, if I two guess, modules um, are using the same name, um, you're going to get a clash somewhere and you're probably going to get something appearing on, a bit odd on your screen so you can get in and, and look at changing that. Um, but generally that, that shouldn't be happening if the module is creating its own TPL file. So for example, it's not Drupal standards to take node and just stick it in your module. You would call it node dash or what something or you would actually change that name. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you, you, um, there, there wouldn't be a guess, you, yeah, there wouldn't I be a direct in, in there wouldn't be a direct hierarchy unless it was one module was called on this page or another was called on another page. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. I hope that helps. <laughs> that was like uh, the tricky question. Points for that one. Um, all right. So basically, that's what we're doing um, to, to theme a module is literally putting it within our templates folder. Um, Flash cache, I guess I just, everybody knows a flash cache, but I just guess I'll say it because you need to flash cache whenever, cache whenever we're doing anything with the theme um, to see that TPL come up. So, but what about functions? So we've had all this talk about templates, but what about the actual functions that are being used in themes? Well, theme funct functions are also inherited. Um, so modules provide their own theme functions. If you want to use, say you want pager, which is one that I use all the time. I hate the way that pager looks. It's ugly, sorry. <laughs> um, so what I do is I'll go in, I'll copy that um, paging theme. So I'll find that within the dot module file. I'll copy that function into my own template file. I'll change the function name from theme underscore pager to my theme underscore pager. Make the changes I want, flush the cache, my theme has the final say, so now I'm going to get the pager that I want to look and I won't get the core uh, theme. I won't get the core theming function there. So looking at it this way, it's basically core modules and fine. So that's theme underscore pager that's sitting there in, in core. Um, in our templates, we would put it under our theme. 
and then we're calling it our theme name under school pager. So if no function is found in our theme, the default will apply. So if I don't have a pager function, it's just going to pick up the normal one from core. But if I do, it will use the one that's in my theme always. So as we can see, there's a running um, thing here that basically our theme always wins. Um, setting template variables, so pre-process functions. Um, basically what a pre-process function does is it enables you to change um, variables for your theme. A little bit there, sorry. Um, so what you want to do is you want to, you copy that pre-process function, once again you put it into your template.php file, you change the name of that function to match your theme, and your template.php will have the final say. So here's an example of that. Um, if we can have a look, pre-process in a sense is an, an override. So what we've been talking about is overrides. Pre-process is a stacked. So here, and we know that it's stacked because see here we're calling in vars and we're calling in hooks. And then in here, we're hooking into that and we're changing that var. So I'm changing that var there to be a new variable of happy hippie. Um, and that's the variable that is then going to get applied in my theme. So it's not completely, it's not rewriting this function. It's literally just depending it. So it's using that pre-process to change that variable and making it into something I want. So um, it's sub-themes. A lot of us use sub-themes. We'll use a base theme and then we'll make a sub-theme from that. Inheritance in sub-themes is, it's a, obviously it's adhering to the same rules that we just spoke about, but because there's a couple of different things going on in sub-themes, um, it does some little things differently. So as we said before, pre-process functions are stacked. So they don't get overwritten, but they go stack on top of each other. What does it mean if we declare in our sub-theme the same pre-process functions as in our base theme? It will get added to what is occurring in the base theme. It's not going to override it. And same with template.php, it's stacked. Okay, so it means that if we've got a template.php and our base has a template.php, it is not, our template.php is not going to overwrite our base template.php, it's going to stack that information. So if I've got 15 functions occurring, theme functions occurring in my base template.php and I've got three occurring in my sub-theme, I will now have 18 occurring altogether because it's stacked them on top of each other. So it means, in a sense, we're inheriting. Um, what do sub-themes inherit from base? Well, template files. What, what can be overwritten? So template files can be overwritten. So all you've got to do is add that template file, the .tpl.php, into your own sub-theme. So if you've got node in the base theme but you want a different node, you simply put that within your um, sub-theme and that's going to override it completely. So it's not going to append it, it's just going to override it straight away. So all TPLs will be overwritten. Now, we were talking about pre-process functions before being stacked. Um, theme functions, overwrites work in the same way. as. So what we can do is we can create a base theme function in, um, in our... So if we have a... We create the base theme function in our template.php. All right. So basically what that means is, is I, if I'm using, um, say I'm using Fusion, and Fusion is doing its own theme for breadcrumbs, but I want to change that breadcrumb display a little bit, what I do is I simply go in there and I copy from my base, I put it into my sub-theme, and it's going to completely override it. It's not going to stack it like preprocess does. Um, and of course we can override the CSS and the JavaScript files by including them um, in our subtheme.info file. Um, another thing that's not inherited is uh, theme settings. Theme settings do not get inherited. So if we want our subtheme to have the same theme settings as a base theme, for example, we'd need to copy that theme-settings.php from the base theme folder and we need to place it into our, our own. So template.php is going to get stacked but theme-settings is not going to get stacked. So you do need to copy that into your own if, if you want to um, either change them or pull them across. Um, so we'll go into uh, CSS files. 
So, so many CSS files. Um, this is just a, a kind of, not even all of it, because it probably would go right down to there, um, of the CSS files that get called in Drupal 7. Um, so you, there's a hell of a lot there. So you're going to, once again, it's the same theme. It, our theme always wins. So Drupal core applies its own CSS files, Drupal mo which gets called first. Drupal modules then apply their own CSS files, so they're applied second. Your theme applies its own CSS files, they get called last, and they overwrite everything. So once again, if it's in our theme, it wins. So our theme's always going to have the final say. So core, we've got H1 coming out as font size 1.6 em. Uh, in, in a module.css, it's doing the same core class, but it's overriding it at 2 em. And then finally in our theme, we're writing it at 3 em. H1 will always be 3 em. It will ignore these two here and it will apply from our theme. Um, what does that mean? It means that it, when we're in Firebug or something like that and we do see um, a CSS we do see a CSS call coming um, that we want to, you know, initially when we first start theming, people might just go display none. Uh, really, we don't need to do that. What we need to do is copy that CSS call, pull it into our own folder. I normally call, create a CSS file called Drupal overrides.css and anything that I'm overriding from core, I just dump straight in there. Um, so my, I might want to override the way that um, template headers are coming out. So I'll just put that in there and override it the way I want it to look. Um, how much time have I got? Okay, cool. All right, because I'm at nearly at the end. Inheritance, don'ts, and do's. Um, so you probably heard around the traps that if you hack core, kittens die. Um, I'm a bit of a dog fan, so I think dogs might die too. <laughs> um, but basically, that's that's kind of um, what's said. So do save your theme in um, site slash all slash themes. Do not edit and save it in slash themes or anywhere else for that matter. Don't overwrite core theme files that live in the base folder of modules. This is called hacking core. Do take a copy of that um, to create, you know, do take a copy of the core theme to create another theme. Um, use a contributed theme. Don't change module slash node slash node CSS. Do take a copy of it and put it into your theme. Um, same with CSS styles as well. You know, if you want to use a module CSS folder, uh, file, and you're, you need to copy that file, but you also make sure that you declare it in your info, um, theme info as well, and then that will just override it. So admin menu, take that CSS, drop it in yours, and declare it in your info file, and all of a sudden you'll overwrite all that module's theming. Oh, did I mention clear cache? <laughs> um, because that's pretty much what you've always got to be doing is clearing cache. <laughs> um, recommended themes, I recommend, I actually use my own base theme, um, but it takes a lot from Boren, um, Boren, and it probably takes quite a bit from the adaptive guys as well, so much credit to them. Boren is, as I said, I'm into accessibility, is the only one that I found that actually um, rewrites core templates into HTML5 with way aria roles, um, if you want to know what that is all about. Um, grab me outside and I can let you know. It's also WCAG 2 compliant, not WCAG 1. Um, Mothership is fantastic. It's by Morton. Um, Mothership is great because it removes core SS and HTML markup and kind of gives you a clean base to start with. Stark is also another good one because it does that as well, though Stark is not recommended for production sites, but you could effectively create a theme from that if you wanted, but probably Mothership is a better one. Um, Amiga and Adaptive. Um, they're WCAG 1 compliant, not WCAG 2. They do have some way area support, um, but they, also, they allow for responsive theming. Um, boring, you'd need to add it in um, yourself with the modernizer JavaScript or something like that. Um, it's a lot to take in. I've done a little bit of a dump. Hopefully some of it makes sense. Hopefully you've learned something from that. Um, any questions? <laughs> Surely I haven't answered all of your questions. Yeah?
Um, under a lot of uh, circumstances, you uh, when you try to change the default output for Drupal, um, you can actually do it on the module level as well as do on the theme level. Yeah. So, um, which way do you, do you think? Uh, wh what's the pro and cons? Do you think about both? Okay. It depends. I, I, okay. So, um, well, basically, you're. So uh, TPL file, for example, as we all know, should never ever have any logic in it. The TPL file is just literally printing something out. Um, where you'd want to be doing things within a module level or within a, a template um, dot PHP, it really depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're, if what you're wanting to do is take something that's already there and just append its look, then you're you're better off doing that. At a, template level, if you're actually creating that module, then at the time of creating it, put the theme functions and that in there, and then they can, people can access the theme functions to you, so that's what you'd be doing. So at a module level, you'd create those theme functions, and then the themer can then use those theme functions to change that theming output. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, you know, but, but in the template, you're really looking at um, the pre-process functions and stuff that you're looking at there is kind of really, I guess, more appending than creating, whereas at the module you're creating that in a sense. So I don't know if that's the best explanation for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Surely someone has a question? Yeah? Cool. So on the, um, the slide you had with that, uh, dozens and dozens of CSS files. Yeah. How do you deal with Internet Explorer? Because it has a limit of, I think it's 32 or 40 CSS files it'll pass before it just starts dropping them. Yep. So how, how do you deal with that? Um, okay, so CSS um, aggregation, basically. So in, the, in, in performance, you're basically pulling, um, you're reducing them down to one CSS. So, so when you're doing that. However, at a template level, um, when you don't want to be doing that because you're in a uh, development site, et cetera, you can be adding in functions and stuff. So if you go into like um, uh, Fusion, for example, one of the theme settings in Fusion, you tick a little box that says um, allow for IE to have more than, than 30, 32 or 30 whatever it is style sheets that's there. So you can actually add that into the settings level. So you're kind of, in a sense, doing the aggregation. So you can get around that. That's basically how you get around it. So if you were doing a Fusion site, for example, and you didn't tick, um, you know, uh, if you didn't tick the IE fix and you tried to view that site, site on IE, you'd get a white screen of death. Yeah, so that, that's kind of how it, get, it gets around it in Drupal. Yeah. No other questions? Has any, have everybody here been using Drupal 7 for theming? Yet? Um, do you find it better than Drupal 6? Do you have any, any pros or cons about it? Anyone? You, mi you miss box? You miss box.tpl? <laughs> I mean, you have to show me how you use it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the depreciations that have happened in Drupal 7 is fantastic um, because apart from the fact that, um, and as I said, you know, just even things like the CSS, hiding uh, element visible, uh, element hidden, et cetera, just enables it a lot easier. Um, the breakdown of HTML and page.tpl allows for that more granular control as well. Same with region um, as well. And the ability to theme fields, I can't stress that enough. Um, because it means that you can get kind of really out of the box and you can start going all circular and circular navigations and having things moving and swishing and everything else with all cool jQuery um, because you can really kind of start to theme specifics. Um, and it also means that you can pull a lot of that markup that's already in there out as well um, around fields, which is really, really good. Um, if I get it, has anybody heard of Boron theme before I mentioned it? Yeah, woohoo! Because um, that's government is actually now WCAG two, and Boron's the only thing that I can find that 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 I would recommend for government sites because it actually complies to WCAG two, and Wearia. Has anybody heard about Wearia? 
All right, um, Way Aria is for rich internet applications, and basically what that does is applies user roles for screen readers, so the screen readers know what's happening in what section, if it's dynamic content and it needs to look at it again because the content's changing and things like that. Um, so if you're doing anything government related, probably have a look at um, some of the Way Aria stuff, it's pretty cool. And that's it, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, oh, cheers.